My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school role playing game podcast. And in this episode, it's a plunge into the thrilling world of municipal tax policy with Power Behind the Throne, Part 2. Our first segment is the basic crawl. Power Behind the Throne is a 128 page adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first edition. Originally published by Games Workshop in 1988. We are reviewing the Hogshead publishing version from 1998, which includes an additional short adventure at the beginning called Carrion Up the Reich. The authors of the original book were Carl Sargent, Phil Gallagher and Graham Davis, and Carrion Up the Reich was written by James Wallace. The artists include Chris Baker, John Blanche, Paul Bonner, Les Edwards, Charles Elliott, Tony Howe, Martin McKenna, and Russ Nicholson. Now this is a big book so we have split our review into two episodes. In part one we discussed the setting that is the city of Middenheim and the supporting cast of NPCs that live there. Now in part two we will look at the sinister chaos plot underway in the city and how that works when your player characters collide with it as well as the interstitial scenario carrying up the Reich that was added in that Hogshead version. So the portion we're covering today begins with the aforementioned scenario, Carrying Up the Reich, in which the party gets caught up in the schemes of a young nobleman named Matthias Blücher. Then we begin with the actual Power Behind the Throne adventure. After a brief introduction section, we have a very helpful section called The Evil Plot, in which we learn that a lawyer, Karl Heinz Vossmeyer, has engineered the introduction of a new set of taxes set to affect a fairly narrow slice of Middenheim's citizenry, dwarfs, clerics, and wizards. It's explained that Vossmeyer intends to drive out these three constituencies in the hopes of weakening Middenheim and to take it over from within, a long-term goal of his order, the Purple Hand. Next, we are given some information on the Toddbringer family, who figure prominently in the story. From there, we skip ahead a bit to Making Inquiries, a section that basically gives the GM advice on how to get the party pulled into the story of Vossmeyer's tax scheme, on which more later. We skip ahead a bit, some more, to a section called People and Events, in which the GM is given some advice on early encounters in the game, plus we're introduced to the spy, Natasha Hess. Then we have an optional encounter, in which Chaos Beastmen strike the city. And from there we have sections with encounters comprising the middle and end parts of the story, culminating in the unmasking of a traitor and a climactic confrontation with Vossmeyer. So, Tom, how have you used this? Well, I GM'd this adventure in first edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which was 10 sessions, although because we play with a maximum of two hours each session, that means if you were running a three-hour slot, you're looking at maybe six or seven traditional length episodes, I would say. Great, Uh, and I've only read it for this show. So things we liked about this portion of Power Behind the Throne. I'll note that much of what I like about this book I covered in part one, so I'm going to be relying on you a little bit more uh, for this segment, Tom. What's so great about this uh, Vossmeyer's tax scheme (laughs) portion of the adventure? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I will say, well, actually, I'll I'll come to that in a a second. There is more going on than just a tax scheme. There's also a doppelganger and a plot to kill the (laughs) the ruler of the city and replace him and so on. Right, right, yeah. But you're right. It it begins in a very low-key way. And I think that is one of the things that is, is both its great strength and a little bit of a weakness. The way in which this plot, and when I say plot, I don't mean like a the story narrative, I mean the sandboxy-ish uh, web of relationships that's happening, is it delivers on a very key Warhammer theme, the sinister chaos plots. So it's recapitulating a bit of what we, we had in Shadows over Bogenhof on the first adventure, which was, you know, essentially like Faust, but with more people in it. They're going to summon a demon. They think it's going to help them out, but it it won't. This is that, but more so. So it's more subtle. It's bigger. It's it's more complex. The campaign it's in is called The Enemy Within. The previous adventure, Death on the Reich, was much more going from place to place, uh, chasing after people in a kind of daring do way. There were chaos plots in it, but it wasn't that subtle. You know, there's (laughs) wandering around a grotesque castle, having relatively relatively straightforward adventure so this then brings the subtlety back into the mix maybe a bit too much there's not that much that has to do with the central plot that involves your action-oriented characters they get some things to do they can fight a minotaur at the carnival there's the thing with the chaos beastmen but they are yeah it's the meat of it is that 
high society well, and low society as well, because that's one of the interesting things, this class crossing plot with lots of things moving around. That's what I think after running it for 10 sessions. So it might be I just have survivor's bias. I mean, what, what, <laughs> what about it appeals to you on a, on a read? Well, to kind of piggyback a little bit off what you said, so we've done several of these Enemy Within Things now, and I'm very impressed by how much the authors of the Warhammer series hate noble people. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, all noblemen are evil bastards and are debauched and up to all kinds of wickedness, and uh, I kind of love that. And that actually, one of the things I like about Power Behind the Throne, this part of it that we're doing today it is the villains. I think the villains are pretty good. So I'll throw in that we haven't talked about it yet, but the little interstitial adventure carrying up the Reich, which you would play before you start Power Behind the Throne, it kind mm. of leads from Death on the Reich. It seems like a really fun little side story. Lots mm. of terrific NPCs. I really like that. And I particularly like the villain, uh, Matthias Blucher. He's such a good, like, love to hate him kind of villain because he's young. He's like 22 or something. <laughs> But he's got all this money, more money than he probably knows what to do with. And yet he still wants more money. And he's just like determined to screw over whoever to get it. And it just reads so much like what I would have imagined would have been some of the inspiration back when this was written. Like Wall Street types, you know, like financial investor types doing their best to kind of suck up all the largesse. And... There are some echoes of that now, too. Um, I think in the culture right now, we have these kind of young men who are driven by nothing more than just, like, greed and chaos. Right? Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. and so I, I kind of like the villain because he's just so easy to hate. But, and he also seems like he'd be really fun to roleplay because he's actually, the way Carrying Up the Right presents him, he is subordinate to his subordinate like he's yes. he's, he's acting yeah. like he's like the the right hand man of his right hand man yeah. and so i also kind of like how just to sort of nail down his villainy i like how he like elevates his lesser in order to make himself appear more sympathetic like i don't know it's just so yeah yeah there's there's a lot he's to just like a dastardly he, character yeah there's, there's a lot to like in carry on at the right and i like in the Warhammer community, I remember it was not that well received because you can argue that not that much really happens in it. But another thing that's good about it is it lays some groundwork for, I mean, this is going to be way in the future. We'll talk about this one. But by the time you get to the fifth adventure, Empire in Flames. So Power Behind the Throne involves the leader of the Church of Ulrich, the Wolf God. And you get to meet him and kind of maybe become his friend or at least, you know, he grudgingly respects you. Carrion on the Reich lets you meet the leader of the Church of Sigmar and have him become kind of your friend. And at the beginning of Empire in Flames, originally, you knew one of those guys and not the other one. It was just like, here's your friend, here's some other guy he's arguing with. If you know both of them, it becomes much more interesting. And, and that was how we found it played out. Yeah, and actually, I think that there's, some, there's good villainy throughout this. Vasmeyer is... Another good I mean, villain, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the other things I wanted to say. Like, yeah. I was using Blucher to kind of roll into Vosmeyer. <laughs> I think Vosmeyer is an excellent villain. What I love about Vosmeyer is the text tells us that he chose to abandon wizardry for the real power of the law, <laughs> right? And I think that says a lot about both the character and the basic philosophy underpinning much of this adventure that he who controls like civic affairs really controls everything it's not the person who can like cast fireball or whatever the equivalent is in warhammer it's fireball yeah <laughs> it's who has control of the machinery right. of civic life and yeah. I, I love that about it yeah and the way they manage his appearance in the i mean it's not like carefully plotted but just the circumstances in which you're likely to meet vasmeyer well you're likely to meet him which is good he's not just like a when a, He's not out of the blue suddenly, oh yeah, that guy we heard about and presumably has an office somewhere around here is the bad guy. It's not like that. It's like a one of Agatha Christie's good ones where, you know, at the end it's sort of, oh yeah, that guy. Oh, I could have known it was him, but I didn't. So it's, yeah, it's just enough of a surprise, but not too much. There are other people that the player characters will suspect more than him. Although that's the thing, he is also a suspect. It's not that he seemed to be perfectly innocent at first and now isn't. Right. It's, he was low on the the list but he was on the list, right. so it's very yeah. good. Yeah, so for me, generally, what I like about this part of the, of the adventure is just the basic philosophy of, like, noblemen are evil. We didn't mention what Blucher was up to in Carrying Up the Reich. Basically, he's trying to 
is it like an insurance scheme? I couldn't quite make it out. Like, basically, he's burning down ships that belong to other people in order to... Oh, well, no, it's he is trying to force the player characters to go to a place where they will be captured as Chaos Gods. He's sort of, it calls back to an adventure we haven't covered, the intro adventure from the Warhammer rulebook, in which the player characters... Oh, this might be why it didn't make a lot of sense to me. That's one of the links that maybe doesn't work so well in Carrying on the Right, because it's a callback that the players probably will never find out about. (laughs) But (laughs) Councillor Oldenhaller of the Oldenhaller contract in Norm. Yeah, so, but he's, yeah, he's basically trying to force the PCs to have no other option but to take his his job. Right, he has a job for them and he's forcing them to take a job. Any, yeah. But there is another reason the boat gets burnt, which is James Wallace wanted to find a way to deprive player characters of their boat so they would have to go and do the adventure. So they'd have to <laughs> do the adventure, yeah. yeah. And we get a little note, though. like It's very subtly implied that this little port of call where the adventurers are at, where Blucher kind of holds sway, we, it's implied that he frequently burns down boats oh, yeah. to get what he wants yeah. <laughs> right like, yeah. like I know, no one's that he's such a prick yeah yeah so that was kind of like i think the basic like the villains i think the philosophy of evil <laughs> that's like operating here i think is really enjoyable yeah so i kind of like that and because it's not something you see very often um and this has been a theme through all of these warhammer things we've covered which is the idea of like civics and civic mindedness mm. and civic affairs, like how it kind of like rises up. It again, it's something I've said before about these. There's this realistic quality that these settings have because of its emphasis on these issues. Yeah, and you're right. And that, that civics theme is the basis of the kind of the mini game, the sort of semi hidden mini game that forms the core of the adventure, which is that all of the major NPCs, the dozen NPCs, are given a kind of rating of how much influence they have over the graph, the the leader of the city. And your task is to amass essentially enough quote-unquote votes to get him to change his mind about these discriminatory uh, taxes. And so that central thing of getting the members of the court on your side is really good fun. And there's also this great inclusion in all the NPC write-ups, not just like what their relationships are like to each other, but also which ones they think have influence at the court. And some of them are wrong about that. In fact, quite a lot of them are wrong about at least one NPC. And I think it's interesting because I'm pretty sure it must be that there's a different point. Like when you're playing this with different groups, each group will have a different time where they make that calculation incorrectly. Our group had the thing where they wanted to see Princess Katerina. They had to get past a chaperone. They thought, we'll name drop a a fancy guy at court. They named the doctor, not realizing that she hates the doctor and thinks he's terrible. And that that was like a funny moment. And so, but I'm pretty sure that, that there are lots of different ways you can do that with different combinations. And it, it's like a very well-constructed dungeon. You can genuinely choose where to go within Power Behind the Throne. I think it's impossible to see every section that's covered in this book. Like, our group did not go anywhere near the guilds. They never talked to that dwarf secretary guy that's covered. They even managed to capture, you know, the sort of the secret agent who's doing the kidnapping, interrogate her, believed her quite rudimentary lies, <laughs> and let her go again, which... <laughs> I couldn't believe it was happening, but I had to just, you know, uh, <laughs> like, uh, so, but I still feel like we got the full power behind the throne experience. Unlike Shadows over Bogenhafen, there are unused bits in that, which I felt were, which was, you know, that pub that has a thieves guild in it. And it had a, like a three page write up and you just read it and thought, when am I ever going to use this? Mm-hmm. Whereas power behind the throne, I look at it all and I, I think I'm glad I have that available. It's a social mega dungeon. It is, yeah, yeah. Oh, we were calling it a court crawl, but I quite like social mega dungeon. A court dungeon. crawl, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I think it's actually amusing that about three quarters of the way through, like on around page 120 or so, they decide there should be monsters of some sort and throw in the and throw in the beastmen attack. <laughs> yeah, although although they're, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. I, we did have one, maybe two players who were starting to go, are we going to like fight any Skaven or something at some they point? Were the so monsters, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so after you've done... F- you know, four sessions of garden parties and opera, you can't really go, but the monster is greed or something. No, you have to, you have to <laughs> yeah, have some exactly. beastmen. And uh, it, it is a good time. In defense of that making inquiries section, which I think is a little oblique, like giving all these little vignettes about how you might brush up against the taxes, that did work in practice because the first couple of days are also not involving fighting monsters or the mystery is just being at a festival. Right, yeah. Which but we you can see all these little yeah. things like uh, angry dwarfs or angry wizards. By the time someone actually talks to them about the taxes directly and says, can you help us? They've already, you don't have to do a big info dump about the taxes because they've heard little bits here and there 
about it, so that was good. Okay, it's good to hear that that works. It does. It does still have the problem that it shows them the taxes, but still never gives them a really compelling reason to care. Mm, uh, although, yeah. more on that later. More on um, that later, yeah. yeah. Well, so, Tom, what else do you want to say about this portion of the adventure? Like, what else did you like about it? I think if I have to pick a highlight, the part that I think is done very well, there's the You Are Feeling Sleepy section, which is where we discover that, what's his name, Dieter Schmiedehammer, the Graf's champion, has been hypnotized. And it's just really fun. It's kind of the easiest part of the plot to discover. As the GM, you get to do the full Manchurian candidate bit with reciting stock phrases when asked on about certain topics. And the players, it's one of those ones where the nature of the mystery isn't hidden. It's like really obvious what's happening as soon as it's presented. But there's still lots of things to prod at and try and figure out what to do with it. So it's very compelling in that way. It's not blundering around for 90% of the time and then 10% of fun at the end. The puzzle solving happens early on. And then, um, yeah, finally, the end game set piece, which is like raiding Vassmeyer's house, chasing his ridiculous customized wagon through the streets, and then having a showdown on the huge bridge that connects Middenheim, which is on a, like a, essentially isolated from the rest of the surrounding countryside by cliffs. And then it's been seeded really early on that the wizards of the city know the command words to instantly destroy the massive bridges. But in all the excitement, you probably forgot that he's a wizard until he busts out that trick. Ah, and then, yeah. yeah. So that, that was very, very satisfying and a really good finale. Awesome. Well, things we had questions about. I have a couple here. Yep. Did your players encounter Stefan Toddbringer? And if so, how did you handle the wildly offensive way in which he is depicted in both the text and illustration? Listeners, Stefan Toddbringer is a neurodivergent character, and the depiction in the text and the picture and the illustration is horrible, like really shockingly bad. How did you handle that? Yeah, it's not great, is it? Um, and No, it's not. <laughs> oh, well, this is the thing. So the answer to the first question is no, they, they never did meet him directly. I'm not sure. If, I think, no, they did see him at court, but they never met him. And I think, and although just like they'd heard about Stefan, who is, he's the elder son, but an invalid, which, of course, is a dynastic thing in a medieval-ish society. So he was a long-running suspect for them because throughout the whole Enemy Within campaign, there's a recurring rumour about the Imperial Crown Prince that he's a mutant and is locked in a tower. So when they heard about another heir being locked away out of sight, they were, <gasps> must be him. But if it were more likely for player characters to meet Stefan in the adventure, I think this would have been talked about a lot more in the Warhammer community, which it is not. Like, as the blog Awesome Lies has noticed, the version of Stefan that got published is, and I quote, much less sympathetic, which is one way to put it, than the early illustrations they did for him. There's a picture of him that, yeah, is nothing like the very well, stereotyped, invalid, drooling character that we get. And you sort of wonder what happened, at which point in the design process did someone go, actually, we think we're going to go with this. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? And it's a real shame because, like, there's a moment of very raw honesty in the write-up when they describe Stefan at first. It says he's a shocking sight, which I think is a very true thing, like where we, we people in general, who are whatever close to typical means have, have relatively invisible problems. Or, you know, when you see someone who's you know, very ill or has a problem you haven't, you've never seen before, you, you do get shocked and you have to kind of deal, you have to think about what that means. The fact is that his family, for all their wealth, don't know how to look after Stefan. And it's a string of it's some quite touching relationships. His father really cares about him right. and is desperate to help him. The, the doctor, for all that he's a ridiculous, lecherous, good living stereotype, genuinely cares for him. And he's important to the shape of the relationships between lots of the NPCs because of the position he occupies. Uh, which, in a way that I don't think I've seen in many RPG adventures. So, yeah, there's all this potentially good stuff in this character but it's not, it isn't made the most of, is what I would say. Yeah, well, and I think some of it is just downright. I just think, I think some of the depiction is just really offensive. Like It is, it's just prejudice, basically. Yeah, I don't even think it's like a, oh, this was written back in the 90s or whatever thing. Like, back then it would have been offensive too. Like, it's like there's nothing about the depiction that is, like, <laughs> great. Yeah. But I, I found it very jarring. Okay, but but I do agree that it is interesting that, like, I think the character is... When you look at the totality of the character, it's an interesting character. There's some depth there with how he, with how he's fixed into the story and like his relationships with other characters. But I think they just kind of missed the mark on the depiction. Yeah, yeah. 
Another question. I can't decide if I like or absolutely detest the presence of Natasha Hess. So, listeners, Natasha Hess is this NPC, kind of an optional NPC, whereby if the players are not doing a good job, like staying on track with the <laughs> yeah. with the plot, Natasha Hess can show up and like nudge them in the right direction. She's this spy character who's somewhat aware of what's going on. And I normally don't like what I call, I call them Gandalf NPCs. I don't normally like those kinds of NPCs, like these NPCs that can kind of shape and guide the character's actions. But on the other hand, this is a really complex yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> and so it makes you wonder, like, maybe they would need such a thing in this particular adventure. Uh, did you use Natasha? How'd that go? I don't think I used her that much. I did, uh, let me think, because I, well, as we'll discuss later, I had some sort of other methods to help keep things not on track, but like remind them what was going on from time to time. I did, uh, she has one bit where she gives them an anonymous note. That's how they first, quote unquote, encounter her. And I, so I did use that purely on the basis that they weren't really getting lost as yet. But I thought, if I want her to be there, if I desperately need her at some point, it would be good to have had her already do this bit. Because mm. the weird thing is they kind of got this mysterious note, used its contents, but weren't that interested in following up who this mysterious benefactor could have been. They're <laughs> like, ah, oh, great. Anonymous help. Right. That'll do. So <laughs> I see why she's there. I think it's probably wise to have included her. But uh, she's not much of a character, is she? She's just, just there. She's a plot device. I mean, she's yeah. just a a tool essentially right mm. and the other the only other question i have is what we're going to be doing in the expert delve which is how did you get the players to care about this tax thing <laughs> um did you have any questions for me uh yeah well i have one because uh, it's now so long since i've first read this adventure and then run it for ages i think this is pretty good but that might be my bias just from having come out the other side of it from having read this sort of interlocking series of evil plots is it good? Do you think? Does it? Do you look at it and think, "Oh yeah, I'd run this"? Uh, what do you uh, think? No, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, no. Um, I mean, maybe playing it is different, but I read it and was like very not convinced. But I like elements of it. Like I like Vossmeyer as a villain, and I like the theory of the adventure. I th- but, but then there's just lot. There's lots of parts of it that just you'd really have to like manage your players' expectations for them to enjoy it, I think, because this is a really particular kind of adventure that is lots of talking, lots of, like you said, garden parties, and very little combat, very little magic, very little monsters. Uh, The only monsters in this module are, besides the doppelganger, are basically optional, like they don't even have to happen. And I had similar feelings about some of those parts of Death on the Reich, too. Death on the Reich redeemed itself in my eyes with that amazing metal-as-fuck castle, but like, <laughs> but there's nothing like that here. And so I, I don't know. Uh, my, my sense is like, it didn't draw me in, but I can see how much you love it, and so it makes me feel like I'm missing something just from a read. But yeah. yeah, fair enough. I mean, I do think it's not as strong as Death on the Reich because it doesn't have those kind of gothic-y, warhammer-y metal elements that you mentioned but yeah. right yeah well with that let's go to the chain lightning round a quote klaus is a very large man there are rumors around town that he may be part ogre and he hates those rumors because he suspects they may be true one of those involved in the kidnapping part of the evil plot didn't know they were going to kill the victim and wants to protect her um, and is locked inside her own room when the PCs arrive. Very in genre for this kind of adventure fiction, I think. And it felt very right in the story to have that conflict within the kidnapper's gang. The drunk merchant Rurari Roddy in Carrying Up the Reich has a pretty terrific quote. Um, it's too long to read here, but it looks like a hell of a lot of fun to roleplay. <laughs> yeah, I, I made him reappear in Empire in Flames. He's good. My next one. Oh, yeah. Some of the clues that the player characters get about the conspiracy are due simply to mistakes by people in the conspiracy, which often doesn't happen. It's like someone has forgotten to destroy a note they were meant to, you know, make a copy of this and then destroy this, and then they don't destroy the first one, which I think is great. Very seems true to life. And it's not incompetence. It's just a simple, slight mix up. Really good. Uh, Listeners, I'm a lawyer in real life, and the Worshipful Guild of Legalists is a much better name for a lawyer's association than anything I'm a part of. <laughs> I like the fact that because he had two out of three relevant votes for his conspiracy sewn up, this is about the tax part of the plot, Vasmeyer himself voted against the taxes. 
because you'd expect him to vote for them. But he, it's like yet another fake out in a way that blink and you'll miss it. But very good. He's a good villain. He's a really good yeah. villain. All right, and uh, just quickly, I've got some bonus Roddy trivia. I think you'll like this, Jason. So, uh, Rory Roddy is named after a real guy. Um, he won an appearance in this adventure in a charity auction at a gaming convention. I'm not sure which one. I'm going to guess Leprechaun in Dublin. And I think it was the thing where you got a bonus reward if you paid the most for a single lot in the auction. So Irish cons have a big thing about charity auctions and everyone tries to outgenerous each other. Because of that, I felt compelled to play him as Irish in our game, even though that's a continuity error, because in our game, Irish accents are reserved for elves and dwarves. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Let's go to the expert delve. It's the expert delve. Our topic today, at which we have hinted at several times now, is how do you get the players involved in this plot involving taxes in Power Behind the Throne? But the bigger topic is, as you've noted here, Tom, how to make friends and insert yourself into the scenario. I like that a lot. I think it's a really interesting topic because, as we've noted, the book spends a lot of time explaining the ways, all the ways, in which the player characters can learn about the taxes and how they might get involved in the bigger plot which I think underscores a real difficulty here, just from a read at least, is how do you get them involved? It sounds like you had a different experience, but my initial thought was I don't think it helps that this adventure takes place against the backdrop of this citywide carnival, which we discussed in part one, in which there are presumably lots of distractions. There's lots of things going on, but it sounds like you were able to kind of guide the group despite that, or at least, or maybe maybe that actually enhanced, you know, because they were able to hear the clues about the taxes while they were enjoying the carnival stuff. But yeah, I just, I just had the feeling that like, they're spending a lot of time on this, like how to get the players hooked into it. And I was not sure if it was going to work. And it sounds like you still weren't, I mean, were you ever able to get them to care about the tax thing? Like how'd that go? I don't know if they specifically cared about the taxes, but they did care about solving the question of what was up with them. But yeah, I mean, your impression is, is right. In Woofrup circles, Power Behind the Throne has always been viewed as this kind of well, it's a great scenario, but how do you actually, how do you hook people in? And I think it's a pretty common thing, especially when you are doing like a highly factional urban setting. You're like, but when you're kind of thinking about how factions fit together, you can sometimes end up with this sort of hermetically sealed machine where the, the scenario ticks along perfectly without the PCs showing up. It doesn't need them. It doesn't invite them in. Yeah. So how do you get from oh, these taxes are weird to let's do the adventure? This is also more difficult for long-term campaign games. In a short run or a one-shot story game, you would just go, okay, everyone design a character that is interested in solving the mystery of these taxes. Let's go. I'm glad you said that, what you just said just now, because this to me was my big takeaway. And this is not really advice for the topic at all, but it's just where my brain went, which is I feel like we have here a really great example of how story gamer play culture departs from more traditional or OSR play cultures. The former is very much, like you said, this is what the story is about, and so this is what we're going to do. Whereas I think more traditional or OSR play cultures are trying to maintain some kind of I don't know, some kind of like experiential or verite or simulationist quality whereby the characters you know, they might get involved in thing X or maybe they won't get involved in it. It all just kind of depends on the choices they make. And yet the trick is that power behind the throne really wants the characters involved in thing X. So it's a weird tension to me. Yeah, it's like, Oh, yeah. wander about and discover things because that's what you do because this is a simulation, but you really need to do this tax thing. Yeah. Whereas I think in a story game, it would just be like, here's the deal. Here's what's going on. This is what's been going on in the city. Your job is to discover the truth of why. I feel like this whole book would be about 75 pages shorter if there was just a paragraph that, like, yeah. did that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Where it's like, possibly. here's what's going on, and you need to figure out what the deal is behind it. Done. But I feel like, uh, on the other hand, I, I see what you're saying, what you said in the earlier segment about they got to enjoy the carnival, and they started to pick up little clues about the taxes. And so I like the sort of organic nature of that. And it does, again, make a lot more sense in a longer campaign that it would kind of play out like that. But... I don't know. I just I just felt like a real culture clash reading this, this book. Yeah. Although you'll be pleased to know that my solution, um, and hence the title of this segment about uh, making friends, is I kind of halfway did that. Essentially, they, they, they met a bunch of people, and particularly they liked hanging out and drinking with one of the elves, the minstrel guy, whose name I've forgotten completely. 
after like meeting them on kind of two consecutive nights and drinking until the the wee small hours he kind of was friendly with them and he asked them about the taxes and said i you know some i made up some nonsense about like i can't really look into it because i'm a prominent elf and it's to do with dwarf something like that i don't know and then a bit later he checked back in with them and explained the mini game as sort of well you know i what we need to and he literally would say what we need to do is get this much influence on the graph right, to have him yeah. reverse the taxes um which was yeah slightly lampshaded but yeah, this i think is the trick if you want to do this semi-seamless method is have the player characters make friends with people so like if you look at yojimbo or a fistful of dollars very early on when he arrives in the town the protagonist makes a friend the innkeeper or, or the is he the undertaker in the western version i forget but yeah who like meets him early tells him about the two gangs and then checks in on him periodically so so how's it going with the gang at that end of town right, and sort of yeah. reminds him what he's doing you know and uh, yeah that's that's pretty much how i did it uh, on the way there verna met a childhood friend i got him to specify who that was i just said who knows kirsten young who's the fiance of the graphs champion so they had an in with the graphs champion and his future wife they had a way to get into the court and meet people um, yeah, Raleigh, and that was the name of the minstrel. I knew it was in the notes. If you throw enough NPCs at the group, the players will like at least one there. of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's like the counterpoint. You know, we, we've often talked about the whole thing where, you know, when you're a player, you can often find yourself wanting to hang out with so just some random NPC that you enjoyed the scenes with. That's what you're kind of using here is you just kind of have a field of NPCs, all of whom are connected to what's going on in some way. And then there you are. As you've described it, it's so comic. Yeah. The player characters are there watching something in the carnival, and this parade of NPCs is like, hey, did you yeah. hear about those taxes? Well, what about those taxes? Oh, <laughs> those taxes. I kind of lightly touched on it in the intro, but th the scheme is Vosmeyer wants the wizards and the dwarves and the clerics to self deport from Middenheim <laughs> because the taxes are so high. That's the whole scheme in order to weaken Middenheim. Well, wait, he also wants to murder the Graf and take <laughs> and take over. Which, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. But like, but the sort of like the tax part of it. Yeah. It's so arcane and so like yeah. it's so abstract <laughs> and requires so many steps for that to happen. I mean, I, yeah, there's the murdering the Graf part that kind of eventually becomes into the fore. But I don't know. It's so funny the way you described it. Like just people like occasionally popping up talking about the text i don't know yeah I mean, well, that's, to, to, that's... to the player characters who are not remarkable in any way like that's well, another you say part that, but i mean they were winning minotaur fights and uh <laughs> oh becoming the the graph's champion oh except oh no no that's like our guy he he was one fight away from becoming the new champion and he blew right. it um so, <laughs> yeah so i like, know there are ways for them to become minor celebrities and just like that's why the carnival part is important to avoid exactly that problem, though. <laughs> right. Like you've got to have believable ways to meet like two people. To who meet are, people, who want to yeah, talk yeah. So yeah, it's yeah just, there is that. Gosh, it's a lot. <laughs> Yeah. It, just feels it didn't like seem like it at the time, but now that you now that you <laughs> now that we're talking about it, you're right, you, I think you might be right. Yeah, the way you've done it, I'd say it's this like platonic ideal. It's not you did it. It's an actual thing. Like the way you did it, like you know they're enjoying the carnival, and then they gradually just pick up the tidbits. I, I, I'm assuming it wasn't as comedic as you've just described it in practice like people just kind of showing up every scene talking about the taxes to them the way you've described it like this sort of picking up the clues and eventually presumably warming up to what's going on is it makes a lot of sense to me it just feels like a lot of work for this yeah that, that's why you've got to make sure the carnival stuff is fun when you're because i tried right. to soft pedal the taxes a bit because <laughs> they the player characters were annoyed with them already because they'd had to pay them on the way in yeah. So I kind of wanted them to bring it up, like, well, how's that with these taxes? Right. So yeah, I, you just got to have some fun with the carnival stuff for, for a bit, and then it's okay, I think. Yeah. But yeah, that's the tip, is just have people say hi to them like normal human beings, <laughs> and, you know, see what happens. But just a routine drumbeat, an onslaught of NPCs <laughs> well, who that care about the well. plot. <laughs> that's our tip for it. For well, no, that's true. Yeah, you've got, you've got to choose the characters as well. Like, yeah, there's no point having them meet... Like some of the NPCs, I think, are a bit irrelevant. Like the hunt master, right? Who cares what that guy thinks? You know, like so. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was selecting ones who were, yeah. Like, I think the minstrel is a good choice. The princess, um, people like that. Ones who were sort of in the court, but not that political. So they, you know, the sort of people who would also hang around with common oafs like mm. your player characters. Side note, mm. I get the impression that this adventure in the wrong gm's hands is going to be so boring <laughs> you know, oh yeah be, no no it's, it's going to be such a disaster waiting, to right? waiting to happen like i mean there are so many stories of it yeah of people railroading their players into doing the investigation yeah, and then getting bored or... and there are a lot of people just kind of giving up because they sort of 
something happens early on that, you know, for example, I believe friend of the show, Lowell Francis, had his group just sort of had, I can't remember, something to do with one of them being, I mean, part of his problem, I think, was that one of the PCs was a troll or something. And so, like, got exiled from the city after about 20 minutes, and then that was it. It was, it was just done. So, <laughs> I missed that story, but that's great. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing and perhaps getting it very wrong, but I believe it was roughly along those lines. To add a whole new dimension to the problem, to, to this expert delve, what if one of the characters is currently exiled from the city? How do you get them to care? I mean, this is getting a bit like a Dragon Magazine sage advice column, so let's not, <laughs> let's not do that. But, uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> listeners, my advice is summarize this and get the players on track. Uh, if you want to play it out like Tom did, I think Tom's advice is great. Like just you, But I, I really feel like this is a GM's, capital G, capital M, GM's adventure. Because like, you've got to make the carnival fun. You've got to make a cast of dozens you've and dozens could, of NPCs you fun. You've got to put voice notes for yeah, every you've, I mean, you, uh, this is a lot, right? Like, like it's time. just... This it's it's a lot, uh, but I know you can handle. It. That's the thing. Like I would love to play this with you because you you're very good at characterizations and stuff. I can see why this worked well for your group. I mean, I, I will say I do have a group who are very willing to buy into stuff <laughs> as well. They were like, right. like yeah. I said up front, like guys, this adventure is a bit weird. So just you know, <laughs> right. see yeah. see how it goes. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll they'll yeah. they'll make poor decisions um, that are in character as well and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, I think if you're playing a kind of quite analytical character as a pawn style where you try to do things to maximize the benefit of your character every turn this is absolutely not going to work for you because the first thing you'll do is leave (laughs) yeah all right well with all that said on that bombshell let's go to the companion adventures all right It's the Companion Adventures. Um, I will make a note here that listeners uh, do go listen to part one's Companion Adventures because I think that's where, for me at least, I kind of did all the flavor Companion Adventures and the sort of environment and spirit of the module adventures back in that one. Uh, But I have a couple things here as well. But you have quite a few. Tom, uh, let's talk about your films. The first one I have is The Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the 2002 one with Jim Caviezel and a very, very young, slightly chubby Henry Cavill. Yeah, not so much for the plot, and that's why I'm recommending the film rather than the book. But just for the general uh, ambiance, you know, garden parties, cobbled lanes, busy docks, marble floored mansions, uh, I think it has a lot of the look of the way I think of uh, Power Behind the Throne. Great sword fight at the end as well, by the way. Another film, The Manchurian Candidate, the 1962 one with Frank Sinatra. Quite a lot of Vass Meyer's plot is based on this film, including the, the r- repeated uh, stock phrases under hypnosis. There's also a book and another film of this, but I haven't seen them, so I, this, I'm recommending the 60s one with Angela Lansbury as well. That's the Wait, that's a spoiler. Anyway, Angela Lansbury's in it. Wait, is that a spoiler? Ah, oh, whatever. <laughs> the newer film is pretty good too, actually. Uh, you have one more film too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, To Live and Die in L.A. of 1985, mm. which I'm recommending not because I think... Actually, weirdly, I don't know. I was When I was thinking of films to more films to go with power behind the throne for some reason i kept coming back to this and i think the reason is well it's a bit convoluted but also willem dafoe distractingly young willem dafoe in this sort of has the air of a purple hand chaos cultist to me there's a lot of you know knocking around doing kind of very arcane things in uh, secret rooms and wearing silk dressing gowns you know it's all uh yeah, I think it's a good performance as well. So Yeah, I can definitely see that. It's a good movie too. Yeah. I have a couple of, to jump off yours, a couple of role-playing notes as well. I really like Diane Kruger as actress-turned-spy Bridget von Hammersmark in mm-hmm. the Quentin Tarantino film Inglorious Bastards. I think this is how I would portray Natasha Hess. Like, if I did have Natasha Hess mm-hmm. in my game, I would I would portray her like Diane Kruger, who's excellent in Inglorious Bastards. I also have, uh, just to keep going with the, the QT references here. I was going to say, are these only Tarantino <laughs> things are really? yeah. I have Eric Stoltz. Is it Stoltz? Stoltz? I don't know. One of those. Eric Stoltz will say, as drug dealer Lance in Pulp Fiction, this is how I would portray, there's a, a dope dealer character, Bruno Cole, who figures into the plot. I think that the way Bruno Cole is described, I could see a, a, a Lance kind of character in there, yeah. characterization. Uh, you have some TV things too, don't you? Yeah, mine are character notes as well. Uh, the Sharp series with... Uh... Sean Bean. So the Sean Bean voice was my model for Dieter the Champion. I think he has that sort of rough around the edges, perhaps mm. risen above his station kind of feel to him. A He'd be pretty good. Thing, right? Yeah. And uh, not Northern, but also just Alan Partridge, I guess, in uh, 
maybe Knowing Me, Knowing You is the best series to watch for this particular very puffed up, convinced of himself version. But any of it's fine, I'm sure. And he is definitely my model for Siegfried Prunkvoll, the mm-hmm. the pompous idiot uh, who is the eternal champion. Uh, no, he's not called the eternal. What's he called? The Knight Eternal. That's it. Right. And yeah, yeah we so, talked about him last yeah, time. He's great. We did last yeah. time. He's a great NPC. And uh, my sort of. I don't know if I was quoting Partridge directly, but I was definitely in that headspace of very self-satisfied. Uh, and just for reference, my Dr. Pavarotti uh, sounded a bit like uh, Giorgio Locatelli, the chef, if you can look him up on YouTube, especially the way he <laughs> said the word perfect. That's nice, good. I have one more thing. Um, so I am a, this is something that maybe listeners don't know about me, but I devour, like devour all youtube theory videos related to a song of ice and fire like i watch them all <laughs> like literal hundreds of hours of youtube just look at my history it's crazy i also did not know this <laughs> anyway one of my favorites is uh, preston jacobs uh, preston jacobs has a lot of very interesting theories about a song of ice and fire books very complex hours and hours worth of interesting thinking i'm going to recommend preston's uh, series the little finger debt scheme if you've got uh, a few hours to spend on this it's very very enjoyable but basically little finger uh, the character little finger peter baelish in the series according to preston jacobs is masterminding this whole scheme to sort of destabilize the westeros and i was just reminded of this when i was reading about vosmeyer i was like oh, this is good so if you if you need more undermining of, of <laughs> civil life in order to weaken kingdoms in your life and you've got i think five or six hours to spend on it uh, by what? all means <laughs> go watch this series it's great <laughs> And with that, listeners, that's our show. Um, a Fear for Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at GauntletRPG. There's a website, gauntlet-rpg.com. Uh, there's a forums, forums.gauntlet-rpg.com. If you have any thoughts on this episode, please go let us know there. We uh, are on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. We always love a few bucks there. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Jason, thank you. And of course, thank you to our editor extraordinaire, Rich Rogers. Indeed. Take care. Hi, listeners. There has never been a better time to get into online role-playing games than right now, and The Gauntlet is one of the best places to give it a shot. We've been organizing and running hundreds of game sessions each year since 2015, and we're always happy to welcome new players. Today, I want to talk about two things, Gauntlet Hangouts and Gauntlet Community Open Gaming. Gauntlet Hangouts is our regular weekly game schedule, where players and game runners come together to run the best indie tabletop role-playing games around. Right now, we have a limited number of $10 spots available on our Patreon. These $10 spots are the best way to get involved with Gauntlet Hangouts because they give you RSVP priority for new Gauntlet Hangouts game sessions. These $10 spots also come with the regular benefits of Gauntlet membership, a Codex magazine, access to our Slack group, and you help keep podcasts like this one going. But you need to act fast. There are only 35 of these $10 spots available for calendar year 2020. The other thing I want to talk about is Gauntlet Community Open Gaming. Gauntlet Community Open Gaming is a special weekend of gaming we have put together to help support folks who are trapped in the house because of coronavirus. The first Gauntlet Community Open Gaming weekend is April 16th through April 19th. This special event is completely free. Anyone can join up and play, and features an amazing lineup of games, from Hearts of Wulin, to Trophy, to Pasión de las Pasiones, and much more. To learn more about Gauntlet Hangouts and Gauntlet Community Open Gaming, head over to our website, gauntlet-rpg.com. Thanks.